Welcome to the Star of Brian. I want to introduce, uh, you know, Bobby Ocampo with Revolution Ventures. Can you guys uh, give him a round of applause for me, please? Hey, thank you. Woo! Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started. Uh, if if Bobby, you want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, introduce. Uh, yeah, who sure. You are and First, uh, what's your name? Mine. Yeah. Mine. I love your shoes. They're great. I saw you could see them a mile away. They're great. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Anyways, thank you all for coming. I mean, I um, I'm very honored and to be here. And I it's because of people like you that we have an industry. Um, I was telling Leo right before we started that when I first got into venture five years ago and I moved to D.C. from the Valley, um, there wasn't much going on. All the people I was meeting with were really had these ideas, and I would meet with all the people in the world and just wanted to meet more and more people and. It's funny how many of those people actually turn into really great success stories, like Tim at Living Social or the folks at Wedding Wire, and all started with these like people would come up and we'd go talk and have a beer, and yeah. and it started from that. So th this is really where it all begins. Um, so this is great. So thank you for having me and thank you for coming. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, we always like to start you know these these fireside chats with a little segment on you know the earlier days. We promise we'll keep it a little bit more bridge. We won't tell a life story, but um, you know, Bobby, can you share with us a little bit about uh, where it was or at what point in your life, uh, you know, did you, did you find this as your calling or how did you get to this point? Yeah, I don't know if it's my calling yet. I'm trying to figure okay. that out. Okay. But so anyone here work in finance? Anyone here like a banker ever before? I know where's Oliver. He's, he's over there. Yeah, he's a banker. So I, I actually, uh, my parents are entrepreneurs and so I grew up in the valley and they were in technology so I assumed I had to be in technology too. I mean when you're out there it's kind of like living in DC if you're not in the government then everyone doesn't really understand what you do oh, yeah. and I thought okay there's only one option for me so I was worked in tech and worked in startups I was in school and whatever and unfortunately I graduated during a really hot job market and all my friends were applying to these finance jobs and getting paid and getting big bonuses whatever and I thought okay well I don't really know what I wanted to do I thought I wanted to go to grad school and be an engineer or whatever and so I just applied to a bunch of finance jobs like banking jobs like all my friends did and I just picked the bank that let me pick my group and my location so I knew I wanted to work in tech and I knew I wanted to be back in San Francisco so I did that and I hated it it was terrible I mean that I was I was there from like 2006 2007 like 2008 2009 and it was it was just it was the worst time to have got in basically gotcha. and um, it was really tough and so I, I, I didn't that's only really the first part of the story and how I got into venture but basically most uh, a lot of firms really look for folks who uh, were ex bankers because they can help crank and do work for you and, and I was looking at a bunch of private equity firms and venture firms and there's this little known firm it called Grow Tech Ventures in DC that was looking to add people to the team and I interviewed and it was one of the firms that's looking at and happened to stumble upon it and ended up being a really uh, uh, fortunate and lucky to get that cool. yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I know that Grotech you know was was heavily recruiting you a good bit well, in terms of you know they were they're definitely interested in you um, can you can you shed a little bit of light how you know how that relationship was built uh, yeah. you said you know you you had saw them in DC uh, can you give us a little bit more about you know how that relationship was built and then also in terms of what you did there yeah sure so people I don't know if a lot of people know the story but it was actually uh, I think a cold call or a cold email um, I most people ask me, so how do you get into venture? I'm like, it's not, I'm not smarter than a lot of the people who are applying for jobs in venture at all. But I would go out and I don't mind getting rejected and emailing a ton of people. So I, I did the numbers, right? I think I uh, emailed close to 75, maybe 100 people within the, the venture industry, different firms, 100 different firms maybe. And I got replies from about 40% of them. Um, I got interviews from about 50% of them. I got Find around interviews from about 50 more percent, then got offers from like four or five and whatever. Yeah. It was a numbers game, right? And some really smart people who go to Stanford and Harvard or whatever at 4.0 GPAs and all that, they'd apply for like one or two jobs. They just drop their resume in the resume drop. And they don't really do anything above, above and beyond that. I'm like, how? You're crazy, right? Like, I don't understand these really smart people who just think they're going to differentiate themselves by just being one of 100 or 200 resumes, right? So I really, I just, if people ask, I just beat the door down until people couldn't say no after a while. You don't want to be that annoying, but I, I kind of was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously it worked out in your... Well, I mean, we'll, we'll see, your, right? Yeah. You get lucky every now and then, and you latch on to the winners, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, when you were at GrowTech, uh, you know, there's some pretty cool companies I read, uh, uh, you know, when I was stalking him, of course, uh, doing a little research before the interview uh, that you invested in um, or, you know, that you were also part of the investment. Uh, can you tell, you know, some of the startup grinders what, what those were? Sure. So the big one you all probably heard of is Living Social. 
uh, we backed them when it was four guys on top of an antique store in Georgetown. And really, they were the first people to really get a ton of users on Facebook before anyone else could and before they really outlawed a lot of spam. And so they had this great user acquisition engine on Facebook and, and they just capitalized on that. And before they were even daily deals, they were pick your five. I don't know if ever, anyone ever used pick your five or pick your five favorite books or your, or your movies or whatever. And they were able to go from zero to I think like 40, 50 million users of that app. And we, okay, well we started to try to monetize that. And then we had our first daily deal, which I think was a sushi deal in Georgetown or in DuPont or a, a bus deal to New York. And we sold out like several times over and a lot of the people who bought them were like board members or investors and employees but we kept running and kept getting bigger and bigger and then we got lucky and went from four employees to at the height four or five thousand and it was it was a great story right and I think it still is and, and unfortunately Groupon and and uh, you know is another big player in the space but we, you know that was probably the one that everyone's heard of and uh, we're still happy with where it went and if people looked at where it went from from where they were doing Facebook apps to now um, it'd be a good story, but all the stuff that happened in between was probably not the best thing for the company PR-wise with Groupon and all that. So, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so now you're at Revolution Ventures, uh, and and you know I, uh, we, when we were talking in the back room there, you know you you said it was more of a lateral transition because uh, GrowTech had partnered up with uh, Revolution on certain deals, yeah. or, or also had gone in on certain deals yeah. alongside them. Uh, you know, how, how has your time at Revolution or how was your time at GrowTech different? Uh, GrowTech was probably more uh, enterprise focused. Gotcha. Um, we have more of a consumer focus at Revolution. Um, not to say we'll stay away from anything enterprise, but we're not going to do like, what's a company we probably wouldn't, like MongoDB is a company we're never invested in, right? We're just not, that's not what we do. Um, but companies you probably have heard of, like uh, we also invest in Living Social. That's how I got to know the Revolution guys well. We were co-investors with Revolution at the, in the early days. Uh, another company, we uh, invest in Zipcar. We we're the first investors in that company. And we bought this uh, company, honestly, run by, uh, at the time, hippies in, in Portland called Flexcar. <laughs> we merged it with an another hippie-run company called Zipcar in San Francisco. Merged it to put $50 million to work and, and made that work and sold to Avis and, and all that. And then uh, I'm trying to think of other companies you all might have heard of. Uh, Clear Spring, another one here locally. Um, Revolution Money, probably the th fourth or fifth biggest credit card processing network that no one's probably ever heard of, which is bought by Amex. So we're all just trying to uh, define the next industry to, to try to disrupt. And that's our thing with companies is that we're not really um, looking for new emerging categories. We're trying to find uh, categories that just haven't been changed in a long time. And we have a model to disrupt that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of you know any any future plans, I, I know I'd ask you back there to give a little thought to that as well. Uh, uh, you, you said right now you're still trying to figure out what you're doing. I think uh, in some way, you know, maybe all of us are. And that's why we become startup founders because we don't want to waste someone else's time or ours. That's right. Working for someone else. Uh, you know what what's in the uh, the future for Bobby Ocampo? I don't know. I think their venture is really hard and technologies are really hard. I mean, it's so hard to make money. I, even for us, right? Think about how crappy it is for me. I mean, I know, I know you guys are all going to laugh, but think about it, right? We have a $200 million fund, right? If we return 2x that, that's an okay outcome, right? So $400 million. $200 million goes back to our investors, right? And then the remaining $200 million, the profit, is split between our investors and us, 80-20. So we get a $40 million profit, right? Now, if you split that among 10, 15, 20 people after tax, after vesting of 10 years, that's really, like, I can maybe buy a house, right? <laughs> and that's after, like, yeah. 400, like, a 2x. I know you all are like, uh, like, whatever, VC, making money. It's really hard. I mean, it's a really hard business. And, and a lot of it is luck and being at the right time, the right place. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think that there are a lot of ways to make money at lower risk where you have a lot more control. And we, we try to have as much control as we can at Revolution because we get really involved and probably more involved than some of the entrepreneurs want us to. But that's our way of trying to have more control over our destiny. So I'd say to everyone else, if, you, if you're looking at technology or venture especially, um, it's a tough business. I mean, you know, there's only one WhatsApp every however many decades, right? And you look at the numbers there, we're running it through because we know the partners there. We think the partners took home, assuming you can uh, cash out your Facebook shares, right? We think each partner took home $150 million each that day 
if it closed. Like literally, oh yeah, here, here's 150 million wired to your bank account. Assuming you could sell your Facebook, right? But that's a really good day. Yeah. Right? And, it, 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 we, <laughs> yeah, and you I don't see that, that often, yeah. right? I mean, 150 million, that's, yeah. that's great. But you know, it's, it's tough. It's really hard. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, well, that leads you know, to, to another great question that you know, I, I've been thinking about and hopefully you, know, you, you give it a little thought to as well is uh, where do you see, especially with the advent of uh, crowdfunding, uh, you know, and I think they're working out the, uh, the legislation on that. They're, they're getting all that put together. Where do you see the future of investment in, uh, you know, whether it's startup or small businesses or, you know, et cetera? Where do you see that going in the future? Well, I think it's really trendy to be an investor now, right? I mean, everyone wants to invest in the next WhatsApp or whatever, but it's really, really hard to scale a company. It's so easy to start one, but hard to scale. So um, you have a lot more competition, but to rise above that fray, you really have to prove out the metrics of your business to prove it to an investor that it's worth 10, 50, or $100 million to throw fuel, fuel to the fire. So to answer your question, I think that, frankly, I don't know how hot this market's gonna stay for long. I just don't, I think that people, when they start realizing that they keep putting in $1,000 into like 100 Kickstarter campaigns every day, and they're not getting their money back, or they put it into uh, AngelList and they're not getting their money back, that in the end, we're all out there trying to make money, right? And, and, and that's why a lot of these earlier stage funds and seed funds and accelerators, right, where it takes 10, 15 years to get your money back, not five or seven, hopefully with us, right, where do you really want that money to go to someone else to manage for you that you might or might not see in 15 years, right? I don't know. So with AngelList, it's the same thing. Like, people don't realize that there's so much noise out there. You can put money out there, but do you, are you okay with not seeing it for a long, long time? Because that, that's what people don't really understand. They just say, oh, yeah. So and so is going to mark it up for me and then value it at X, and on paper I make five X, but it's still a long way from actually being in your pocket, right? So yeah. okay, no, that makes sense. Um, so when we had talked earlier, there was uh, there was one question I asked you that just the, the answer you had was just it made so much sense to me, and it was something I've been thinking about. Um, so one of the biggest things that really is a driver of why I do things like Startup Grind and, and you know are, am involved in the ecosystems uh, for startups is. Uh, you know, to kind of give back, put resources into the community. Um, and then I had a conversation uh, a little earlier about why might it be that, you know, East Coast startup or tech hubs have historically had a very hard time uh, competing, let alone, you know, challenging a West Coast tech hub like Silicon Valley or even, you know, other players on the East Coast. And, uh, you know, I asked uh, Bobby earlier this, this question and, uh, you know, I'll hand it over. He had an awesome answer. About why we don't why, why is it that? I think yeah. you gave the answer, but I'm going to steal it from you. But I, well, I guess I have a question <laughs> for the audience, right? Like, why? I find that we're not that far from DC. We're not far from each other. Yeah. But I can count the number of times on one hand I've been to Baltimore. That's terrible, right? It shouldn't be that way. And frankly, you know, a lot of the folks we know and trust well in the Baltimore community don't come out to DC that much either. Like, I wonder, I don't know why that is. I mean, does anyone have an answer to that? Is it, the traffic's bad, but it's not that bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, but. It, it's pretty bad. Culturally, miles apart. Yeah. Right. It could be. And Big I think. Lake, but thousands of miles apart. Culturally really? Between DC and Baltimore. Yeah. To me. So, so uh, Frank Underwood would fly in Baltimore. What's that? Frank Underwood would get nowhere in Baltimore. <laughs> who's, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that is. Yeah. Yeah. oh, okay. See, yeah. I. So, so effectively I speaking, know um, you know, Bobby's trying I don't to say like there, there's. There's really no collaboration in, uh, you know, between the DC or the Baltimore markets, or even in the S uh, East Coast as well, on a regional level. Uh, let alone, you know, from from the standpoint of a local level, where you have segmented, you know, you have your beta mores, you have your other accelerators, incubators. Um, but do they really work together? It's almost like everyone's vying for their own little chunk of the pie. Uh, and I think that was the answer we both agreed on. I right? think so. I, I I don't really get it, and I think a lot of it has to do with. Um, a lot of the people who have money, right? A lot of AOL money, uh, advertising.com money here. Uh, they, there's a lot of sprawl, right? People aren't located. Like you look at it in Virginia, um, a lot of folks kind of live near the airport and in Dulles, right? Which is fine. It's great, but they have big, huge mansions out there. It's it's wonderful. But those people probably aren't that strong in internet consumer internet investing, and they're probably not going to come out to DC often and write a 250, 500k check. Uh, which is the big problem of why I think a lot of your companies in, in anywhere in the D.C., Virginia, Maryland area don't kind of cross that chasm because that market does not exist here. You either have the early stage check, like a 50, 100K from friends and family, your own money, or you're able to raise Series A funding, venture funding, and hopefully make it big. 
But that middle gap, right, where it exists in, in huge amounts in the valley, just I don't know if it'll ever be here. Okay. Yeah, we need a big hit. We need a big exit, right? Okay. We need millennial to to <laughs> pop like 500 percent. We need Living Social to go public. We need O Power to be a great success, yeah. right? To put us on the map, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's a question that I think a lot of the startups or founders in this room are are kind of dying to to ask you, and the purpose of probably why they're here today is, you know. Can you give us a little bit of insight into, you know, what is it just, and obviously all, all investors work differently in terms of what they look for, uh, but, you know, what, what does Bobby Ocampo look for when you're looking at a startup and, and, you know, what are the key things, you know, if you can name the top three yeah. of, uh, of what, where your decision is going to be made from? Yeah. Um, I don't really care about ideas much. Um, some people really value that, like they want the net anti-gravity machine or whatever. I mean, I don't really, if it's like a ketchup bottle and you have a better way to make a ketchup bottle, you can sell it better than anyone, fine. I, I'd rather do that than some pie in the sky idea that has zero. So I, I focus a lot on execution and knowing the people for a long time. So I, I, I told you all earlier about these people that I met four or five years ago starting great companies. Now they're huge companies, right? At, we have a really huge database of, of data points that we collect from everyone we meet every meeting. And so when people tell us they're going to do something, we talk to them again in two months. If they did it and they keep doing that, it's a pretty easy investment for us to make after we track them and, or her and, and they've hit 20 data points, right? And we, well, that's great. But if it's one of those where they keep saying they've been here for a long time, it's four years later, they're still looking for 100K or whatever it is, and or whatever, um, it's pretty easy for us to not make that investment, right? So uh, execution ability is probably number one by far. I, I think one, two, and three for me. And try and, and yeah, I don't, I don't really care much about the idea. No, and if they can prove that they can do a lot on a little, is, is very important to me too. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the strength of the founders, uh, you know, I, I know that that's um, that's one that I've heard repeatedly, primarily more on the angel investment side. Uh, you know, is that something that you also put into consideration, or you know, where does that weigh in the decision as well? Yeah, it ties to execution, right? Like, I, I, it'd be great if that CEO had experience doing what they're doing now, but if they, if not. Uh, it's okay as long as they've been able to prove themselves round after round or month after month or where we can track it, right? I mean, for, for me specifically, I don't, I don't, I can't control the macro, right? But the micro, we can try to control. And if that person can just operate within that environment and continue to perform well, then you would think that the next three months or nine months or whatever the next milestone is going to be hit, that they'll be able to hit that milestone too. So that, that's really what I try to focus in on. Everything else I can't, like, I, I don't know if, you know, what, what's going to happen to, I don't, in clean, I don't know, how, there's so many other things out of our, our control, yeah. but the one thing we can try to control is the team that's out there, right? Gotcha. So. Okay. And when you say execution, just to kind of clarify for everyone in the room, um, are there key things that you're looking for in terms of execution, like traction in terms of users, numbers, or, you know, what, what are you looking for specifically? I mean, revenue is a pretty easy one, right? Gotcha. But Whatever it is, and generally a company that comes to us, and it's usually early, right? So people come and we determine that we, it's just not, like for us, we have to invest anywhere from one to 10 or 15 million initially. And that means they have to be raising three to five million. So it's like a Series A. So most Series A companies are, I don't know, post product, revenues in the hundreds of thousands, if not low millions in run rate, uh, and are, we're just throwing fuel to the fire, right? Um, it's pretty easy to figure out if we're that right person for them. Gotcha. Uh, and generally, if it's like pre-product and still an idea, and you haven't quit your job yet, or put money in, that's a real. Nice. So I, I lost track of your question, but <laughs> that that's sort of what where we like to get in at. Gotcha. Um, and and that's and then we have our growth arm, which does like later stage stuff. So stuff you probably all heard of here locally. Um, they did Custom Ink, which is a big T-shirt company. I hope you all order your T-shirts there. They're big, they're huge. That's where I got mine. Yeah, they're great. They're great. kind of expensive, but they're they're cool. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sweet Green. Yep. Anyone eat sweet green? Well, probably not up here, right? They, what, what's the big salad company here? Chopped? Oh, uh, not from here. Oh, okay. Sweet green? Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> um, and so we try to, I don't know, find yeah. people that get stuff done. That's really it. Gotcha. That's really okay. it. Okay. So quintessentially, you're looking for the movers and the shakers who are going to deliver. And, and people on my team will have a different filter altogether. Gotcha. Like some people, all they care about is the idea. Right, and I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't care. So okay. it's, it's pretty interesting to have everyone has their own view of the world. Okay, okay. Um, fundamentals to, to how to be successful as a startup. If you're at early stage, yeah. uh, you know, this might be even a curveball question for you. Yeah. Um, if you're an early stage startup, you know, what are some areas that they should be focusing on? Uh, I think 
if, if they're going to be seeking investment down the road. Oh, abs- I would avoid people like me as much as possible. Okay. I'm dead serious. Absolutely. I would not. If you are out there at every event, I mean, now it's okay to come to a few and say hi to everyone. That's great. You should. But if you're at every event talking to all the investors, right, you're all pitching at the same time. Clearly, you're not working, right? You were at that tech cocktail event or whatever, startup grind event from 6 to 10. You could have been coding or selling or something, right? Uh, I, if you're that available and, and you really need the cash, I think that's the one thing that we're pretty good at is, is, is sensing when, how, how badly they, uh, an entrepreneur needs money. Whereas with the really good ones, right, they're just getting their work done. And, and the world is so small, I think, in this area that, that those connections are always made, right? So I don't know, if, if I were an entrepreneur and I was to start a company and I just, if I would avoid venture people until the time really came, for sure. Okay. Yeah, because okay. a lot of the time, like, people don't realize that you don't, with like an NEA, right? NEA is a huge fund, right? They have like billions under management. You can talk to them several times and it'd be okay, right? It's, it's fine because if they, they pass early, they can do it later. For us, we, we invest at one stage. So you and I only have one time to really get together if you really are trying to pitch us at, at the time for to raise several million dollars right so we want to make it count and make a good impression you should make it count on us because if if you're raising series a and we determine it's too early or whatever then then that that's your shot right so we you know what i mean like it i, I would just really focus on getting stuff done frankly gotcha. yeah okay okay that's a fair, fair i don't answer. know Some, um, yeah are there any other areas that uh you know you might think uh in terms of you know technology from a technology approach uh you know are you looking for products that are completed are solid or you know does does that really matter because i know that you said that you know the product or the idea doesn't really factor too much for your decision right um the but, idea is so much but the product i, I mean for me yeah I'd, I'd want as much done early as possible so if you have a, a product and and you're shipping and you're generating revenue and you have a bunch of customers and people are happy but you've only invested a few hundred thousand dollars into it and, and have one salesperson you're it then we can determine if we're the right partner for you and that's great that that that's where i i personally would like to be or some people will just say okay big idea and we're going to just go figure it out and, and I'll, uh, I, I don't know I, that's really i guess so, yeah okay yeah okay um, so so generally product i would love product to be done personally and revenue coming in, to answer okay. your question, yeah. Sorry, I gotta check the time, make sure That's we don't right. go over real quick. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of goes back to, uh, I, I wanna kinda jump around back to uh, crowdfunding real quick. Um, so, quintessentially, you said that you think it's gonna kinda, you know, steam, boil, and then fizzle back out because of the fact that, you know, from your, in, you know, your personal experience as being on the other side of the fence, uh, it, it's the expectations are going to be a little bit uh, more than what people expect mm-hmm. in terms of that. Um, now, do you think that there might be a better way or, you know, and, and this is kind of a multi-part question is, um, do you feel or, that there might be better ways or how effective do you think that the systems right now for attaining uh, startup capital, uh, you know, how, how effective do you think they, they are? Because, you know, I, I told you, it's almost nearly impossible unless you have that relationship like you had mentioned. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll let you answer the question. I think that if, you, if you're if you working on something good and you believe in yourself and you're clearly getting stuff done, that the market has never been more fluid than it is now. Never. I mean, you, it is so, it is so easy, I think, right now, if you're looking to raise like a million bucks or something and you got something going, to raise that money and raise it probably in a week. It really, I mean, and, and you, we see it all the time with entrepreneurs that where it's clearly early for us, right, and we want to invest, right, but they, they, they realize that they just want to do it, hopefully get us later and we'll have to pay up, um, that anyone with a good story and, and a, like a little prototype can, it, it's really good and it's going to get better and better, I think. Now the, now the issue is I don't know how hot this market's going to stay, gotcha. right, and so I, personally, I, I, I don't know if I'm long on the market at the end of this year or even in a quarter or two. I just don't know how it's, it's sustainable, right? Um, and so you have to uh, account for that. when you're Because like, honestly, when the mar- if the market does go and um, uh, I guess recede a little, I don't know, then you, everyone's affected, right? Because how it works in venture, we have our portfolios, right? And then we market to a lot of the time to public comparables, which isn't fair, but we have to mar- ascribe some value to it. And so when the public market goes down, 
the value of our portfolio goes down, our, our, our IRR goes down, and so when we're out trying to fundraise for a new fund, our, our, everything is tied to the market, right? So when you're uh, an entrepreneur and you're trying to raise some money, I mean, if you can get and get it quick, and you know that it's probably pretty easy and, and you don't have to do that much work, I would take it, and I would take it now, because I frankly don't think it's gonna last for, for, for too much longer until we kind of have a, have a bit of correction. But I might be completely wrong, and don't sell your portfolios and all that and, and whatever, but that's just my, my take, yeah. And, and we're, we're seeing with a lot of our companies that are software companies where it, how, how, I mean, they're like trading 10, 15 times their revenue multiple, and they're highly unprofitable. Unprofitable, Like, that is not sustainable, right? Gotcha, so. okay. And do, is that the primary reason that you feel that that's the direction of the market in terms of? I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me, right? I mean, back in the day, you invest in a company uh, with a PE ratio, I don't know, of like, I don't know, five to 10 times, where if you, idea, if you invest in a company and you get all your money back in five to 10 years, right? And now we look at every big software company, right? None of them have income. And they're all trading 10, 50, 20, or 20, 30 times revenue. There's, there's no sense in that, right? So maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I don't know, it'll, I, I think it'll self-correct back to okay. something, okay. I don't know. So how long do you think that startups have so that you know these guys know when they need their money by or ask they're not going uh, to I, I don't know. If, if you can raise money now and you don't have much done, I would raise as much money now as you can, frankly. Okay. I, I think that maybe it holds for another year, maybe, okay. but I, I just don't, okay. I don't know. And, and that leads to a good point, uh, you know, in terms of uh, raising money, you know, every, everyone's always being taught to be conservative. What are your views on that? Do you think that you should get as much as you can now? or you know, conservatively raise? I would raise as much as you need to get the next milestone to prevent the, the dilution that would be coming. So if you think that you can uh, figure everything out uh, in six months or nine months to prove out whatever you need to prove out, then get enough cash for six nine months, maybe with a little buffer. Uh, I, I wouldn't raise five, ten million dollars if you don't really need it. Um, that, that's what I would do. And if you can really prove it out and you think you can justify valuation nine, twelve months from now at a much higher price than what you're raising that money now at, then by all means, go do it. Um, but I would not just take cash for the sake of taking cash. Um, and a lot of people are kind of doing that now because they can command it and they can get a big price, but it's great, but I, I don't know. I, I frankly wouldn't run a company like that. So okay. that's just my take. And take a little more money than you think you need to take. I don't know. I, 12 to 18 months is frankly what I would do, of, of burn, whatever, however much that costs you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So figure out what you guys need for 12 to eight months and get it soon because the market's crashing apparently too. Uh. I don't know, I don't know. I would just say, if it's this easy to get money, yeah. then for me, take I take, take it, because yeah. I don't, I yeah. don't know. No, no, right? I, I, I don't agree, know. that makes sense. What do I know, yeah. <laughs> what do any of us know, right? Uh, no, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, do you feel like there's uh, you know, any areas that, uh, that VCs or angel investment uh, you know, can, can improve uh, from your eyes got big there, yeah. so I think there's we can get there's We can get quicker, probably. Okay. We can probably get quicker. Um, it used to take three to six months to get venture money. Now, if you're really hot and doing something well, it could take a day or two. Um, but generally, it takes still a month or two, and a lot of it's legal that cleans everything up and makes sure structure's all correct and the cap table's clean. Um, but I would call, I mean, I'd say to all the entrepreneurs here that um, try to be really organized when you're setting up your docs, your articles, and all that stuff, and have it all in Dropbox or Box, because when an investor comes in, they see you have a clean bill of operations, whatever you want to call it, um, it saves you a ton of time and saves us a ton of energy and time too. So uh, some of the better ones that we're seeing will have like 15 subfolders within Dropbox, right? And wow. have 10 subfolders in each folder, right? So each subfolder. So it makes it so easy that we really have no questions. We just go through all the docs and get it done. And, and this is like Series A, we can get it done in two weeks and that's great. Wow. So I'd be really organized, and it shows well, and, and your investors, I think, feel really good about you if you have that um, in place. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, okay. yeah. Um, any other areas besides just possibly the, uh, you know, the, the um, being faster at, yeah. uh, at reaching, you know, closing? Um, do you think there's any other ways, maybe making yourselves more accessible or even? Yeah, maybe. I think that, um, I don't, I guess a lot, there, there's an issue. I'd love to hear what other people think here in the audience about how, how do you approach a venture firm at the right time and, and how to, the best way to do it? i say the best way to do it is, is to, uh, I mean, there, the world's so small here that there's always a connection. So think about your, your counsel, right, or, or your, your uh, accountant or whatever it is. Chances are they probably the accountant or the lawyer for the venture fund, yeah. and they'll tell you if it's worth 
the right time is now to meet with them or not and then just have them make the connection for you because you really don't have to go and reach out to me or someone like that directly ever. I, it, it just Especially here, right? I mean, I don't know who here, uh, uh, how many people have startups here? Like maybe half? Uh, is your council, raise your hand if your council's Cooley. Only one? Two, really? Okay, well, I mean, DLA or, I don't even know, right? But anyway, let's take the Cooley example, because in DC it's different, right? Probably 80% is Cooley. I mean, you talk to Mike Lincoln at Cooley, and he'll connect you to every venture firm you want to, right? And then you don't have to go and cold email someone, right? Exactly, Carl Grant, exactly, does biz dev for them. So I would lean on your, net, your own network because it's stronger than you think. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and for the startups that you know don't don't have that resource yeah. or support, just because um, you know some some startups don't know where they can get that information or you know even how to obtain those resources, uh, is there kind of a way to determine that you you've kind of come to understand uh, to kind of do a gut check and figure out when it might make sense to start seeking investment? That's a good question. Um, generally, if if you so I don't know if this makes sense to anyone, right? But if if you look at the median of how much money has been put into a company before we put in money, where they are progress-wise, how many people they have. I don't, th this is just ballpark, right? Generally, when we invest, about anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to a couple million dollars has already been put into the company, right? They generally have anywhere from five to 25 employees. Um, product is done, but it's still sort of being iterated. And they're revenue generating in, I don't know, in the hundreds of thousands, right? but they figured out a model to kind of scale that quickly. If you think you're kind of in that zone and you're attacking something that's hard and, and, and you're passionate about it, I, I'd say deep down you'll know. Now, if you're saying, oh, I need to $2 million to hire my team. I got a team out in Pakistan working and, and they're all part-time and I'm part-time. I work at Deloitte and I need $2 million. Like, we're, not gonna, we're not there to find out if there's a fire or not. We're, we're just adding fuel to the fire, right? You, you have to be the ones to determine that or, or building the field. Or we're not there to build the field, right? We're just there to, to play and play in the field, right? So uh, deep down, I think people know, right? That, that's just me. Okay. Right? If you need a couple million dollars to build your, build, build your product, chances are, or, and, and you haven't quit your job yet, and you're waiting for the money. I mean, this happened, uh, 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 this is my prior firm. We were about to invest, right? But we found out that the entrepreneur and the whole founding team hadn't quit their jobs. And they were basically only going to quit their jobs if the funding came in. And then once we found that out, like, Fuck, we're not going to do that, right? <laughs> Why would we do that? Because then they're all going to take like six-figure salaries and be out of cash and forget it, right? Yeah. No. You all have, we, everyone has to be committed to it. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, well, um, I guess that's going to bring in the, uh, the session of... Uh, Q and A. Cool. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. So, oh, come on over. I have, I have a sorry. I have a cord on this. Um, out of curiosity, you mentioned you know the highs and lows of living social from yeah. a, a VC standpoint. From initial investment to where they are now, how have you seen their decisions as far as real estate and infrastructure from technology and you know their the hard office space kind of affect from a PR standpoint and an investment standpoint moving forward with future um, companies kind of how have you seen that change whether it's an investing model or from an advising standpoint how much you actually step into the decisions they make yeah from an advising standpoint on the real estate so did everyone hear that question it was about living social real estate infrastructure and watching their roller coaster ride um, it's a good question loaded question I'm not sure what what you want specifically answered but I guess to answer your question in the first part of it, I mean, clearly it was a, uh, a land grab. I mean, we, we were competing with Groupon. Um, and the only way to do that was to throw more money into user act and to hire more people to make more sales, to go to Joe's Taco Shop and sell them and not Groupon. Um, and clearly, we went from four to 4,000 employees in, I don't know, like 18 months. Or, and we'd fly people in on Saturdays. So I don't know if you ever heard about our Super Saturdays where we would fly in 50 or 100 people on a Saturday for one for like five hours right to do interviews from room room to room to room to room and we'd pick 10 of those people and then we did it for every Saturday for like a year and, and or maybe a Saturday inside something crazy right so clearly we had to put in a huge infrastructure bet on uh, things like 918f which you're probably alluding to uh, and office space we were everywhere and then frankly we grew too fast so we there was um, not enough coverage for all the people that we hired. So you have Susan and John, 
uh, trying to sign up these restaurants in DC, but they're all within like ones in Logan Circle and ones in DuPont, and they all kind of touch. It's like, well, you don't really need five people or whatever covering that territory. And frankly, and, and we, it was mostly defensive maneuver against uh, Groupon, right? Because we had different models, right? They were at, uh, an outbound uh, calling sales, sales model, and we had people on the ground. And we would hire people who lived uh, or went to college in those areas so they knew all the good places to go to. And they actually migrated more to have our model because they found that we were getting all the good merchants. And we migrated more to their model because it's cheaper. So I don't know if I answered your question, but going forward, now we're just trying to grow wisely because now it clearly there's only two winners. There are about three or 400 companies at the, time, at the height. And we've won, but now we have to actually make it a real business. So to answer your question, I think going forward now, we're trying to make it a truly profitable enterprise, not just grow for the sake of growing like we were before. Yeah. Cool. All right, I think I saw a question. I'll get this uh, young gentleman in the front. Sure. Thanks for coming out, Bobby. No, thank um, you, Ryan. I wanted to ask what your opinion on startup accelerators is. So, quick, did you tell him to ask that? So no, he asked about startup that. accelerators. Did you ask? <laughs> did he tell you to ask that? Great minds think alike. Yeah. What What specifically do you want to answer? Do you like what? Uh, should you be part of one or what do I? Yeah, I'm thinking about applying to one. Yeah. I've applied to one and got rejected already. That's all right. Before I was ready, but uh, I have an opportunity ahead of me that looks promising, but it's with a big firm. It's with Disney. And uh, it's intimidating because you know they're a hundred billion dollar company, and I, you know, here I am, 21 years old, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. So, can you? Well, uh, well, well, what do you want out of it, right? Like, I, th I don't know if people, people want to be part of Accelerator because they want to be around people that can help them, right? And and raise a little money. But if do you really need help? Do you really need money? Because if you don't, then I wouldn't do it because they take five to ten percent of your company, right? That's expensive. Um, and that's why I think fundamentally the very best entrepreneurs, right? You know, people debate this, I'll probably get in big trouble for it, but how many of the very best companies ever go through an accelerator, right? Like, the re like the, a couple, but 99% of them yeah, don't because don't. They, could, they know how to do it themselves, they're able to raise money from other people, and they don't need to take the dilution that early, right? So ask yourself what, why you truly wanted to join it. Is it because you want to like, get to know people and build your network and find your co-founder, that's great. You should probably do it. But if you already know what you're doing and you have people signed up and you have a little money and revenue's coming in, then... Keep the equity. I keep the equity. That's what pays out. In Absolutely. That, right? Did that answer your question? I don't know. It's a little more in-depth than that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. Okay. Cool, yeah. But you're, and I mean... I, I and Bobby's a will... lot to think about. I'm yeah. I'm getting into the media space and... <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's by chance that the, the person that's running the entire program, it's a Techstars run yeah. program. Yeah, cool. I met him last April, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, we have a good connection. So it just cool. happened to be. They're good people. Text. They're they're really good people. You and can't go wrong there. Yeah. And that's I, definitely I got something. A lot to think about. Yeah, that's definitely something good. that uh, you know Bobby will be walking around afterwards if you want to take him aside, and, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer. Yeah, your thank question. you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are certain things that startups should focus on, and certain things that may be a waste of their time. Yeah. What would you consider to be a waste of time? <sighs> <laughs> Anything I mean, that doesn't give results. Probably. I mean, I, but you don't have to go to 100 different events, right? You go to a couple. But I, I would set clear goals for yourself, right? If your goal is to raise like 250K for your startup, what's the best way to go about doing that? Um, probably hooking up with one or two of the local young angel groups in DC or, or Virginia or Maryland. Um, not pitching them, but finding out who's in charge and getting to know them. Understand what it will take to get that money. Um, okay, we'll go work on it. Um, go on LinkedIn, troll their networks, right? And then find out, okay, here's, who, here's how they know them. And, the, and then figure out what, how to get from point A to B as fast as you can. Because all that other stuff, right? I mean, I would, like, going to events or, or going to fun stuff or finding it, going to a, a co-founders meetup or, or a Ruby, whatever, right? Like get from point A to point B as fast as you can because in this industry, right, I mean, we have to return money as fast as we can and you want to make as much money as fast as you can, right? So uh, there are a lot of great operators in town who are young who've done a great job of just zoning everything out. You have a goal and then have sprints, right? So figure out what it will take to get to that goal and everything else that, that's not involved with that, just don't even go and just go ahead. So I don't know if I answered your question, but just figure, whatever your goal is, right, just figure out how to get there, right, and, and not spend time, hopefully, going to too much networking or, or 
Oh, exactly. Or like meeting with a, a co-founder who might be your guy or girl or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe that's what you want. So yeah. Sorry, that wasn't that direct. Think, think CrossFit. More, more work, less, uh, less rest, right? Any other questions? We got a couple here, too, oh. and there, there's one there, too, after. We'll grab, uh, Tim right hey Tim. Here. Hey, hey, this is a communication question. Yeah. Um, and this is probably even like even for this this room, as you're pre you, and maybe even in an angel phase. Yeah. Communication. Yeah. Like and not even just coming up and pitching. Yeah. But communication from a holistic sense of how you look, how you feel. Yeah. Uh, when you're not into the 15 subfolders on Dropbox, yeah. but maybe you've got. It's a great question. You've yeah. Got one one like, folder on Gmail. Yeah. Like what what. I'd, like thoughts on what? Yeah, the, what's the, what's the best way to do that in a lean, effective way? What would be your thoughts right off the jump? If you were even to say, here's three good points yeah. on how to communicate effectively when you hand them yeah. something post the conversation. Can I practice with you? Can you pretend to be a VC and I, I can be like an entrepreneur or whatever? <laughs> my VC okay. mode. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Go. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm Bobby. Tim, hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Bobby. Hey, I know you're really busy. I just want to drop by and say hi. I have a startup called So and So. Like I, I make anti. So and So. Yeah, good, that's a good URL. Yeah, I make Great anti-gravity job. machines Excellent. on my spare time. Right okay. now, it's starting to get a lot of uh, commercial pickup because people really just love anti-gravity. I guess. I love it. Uh, but I know you're busy, and I know you probably don't believe me, and you look interested. So I'd love to. Here's my card, and if if you have one too, I'd love. I'll ping you. I know you have a lot, a lot of people to talk to. If you're interested, I can plan to send you an email, and then maybe we can chat for ten or fifteen minutes, and, and that'd be great. Great. I'll I'll look forward to your email. That's it. Right? I don't know if that was good, right? But sorry, I didn't have a good name for a company or uh, what we did. But <laughs> but yeah, but quick. It, it, I don't know. No, it was good. That, that's I what. Liked it. And so, in, in terms of like, did you ask the dress and all that, or did no, you want them like, to answer it, that too, or no? Uh, after okay. the conversation, yeah. after we've talked, yeah. And then you're gonna say, okay, now I'm expecting an email from yeah. you. What should you have? What should you have put together? Short. So I, I the, those TLDR don't do not send a, a 15 meg deck. Do not write five paragraphs, right? Don't send it at like 12, th send it at prime time, like 9.05, 9 a.m., Monday through Thursday. Uh, three sentences, hey, we met here, here's what I do. I'm making great progress, so I don't really need to talk to you, but if you're interested, I can tell you a little bit more about me. It's almost like dating. I, read this, I wrote this blog post like four years ago about how uh, uh, raising ventures, like um, getting a first date or any date, and you want to kind of play like hard to get. Like you don't want to be the guy or the girl who is dating everyone, and everyone knows it, and you're just giving away your candy for free, right? I mean, who, <laughs> no one wants that, right? You want the ones like talking to people, kind of good looking, working on stuff, but might be too good to talk to you, but maybe, maybe it'll work out, but I, I'm watching him or her, right? It's a game. It really is, right? And I hate to say it, but it's effective. And a lot of people raise money because of, of being really good at that, yeah. Good Great, stuff. All yeah. right, we got time for two more questions. I'll take uh, this gentleman right here. First off, uh, Matthew Ironman. Hey, Matthew. HD scores. Uh, hey. Th th thank you for coming up. From no, PCA. thanks for coming. And then uh, second, term sheets and standardization of term sheets. Yeah. Uh, seem, uh, we've seen a few that have had some crazy terms. Yeah. Uh, it's more so in the angel world. Yeah. But it seems that VC and angels are, I guess, I guess cleaning up their docs and I guess making their docs more similar. Yeah. What should I guess? What are your biggest things that you're looking at in the term sheets? Because obviously you you guys have pre, I'm assuming pretty standard term yeah. sheets that you guys use. What are the big things that you're looking for in the round if you're either leading or not leading um, in those term sheets? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's about term sheets and what we look for. Um, so we come in early enough where it's not. Like generally, we're not our terms aren't too onerous, and we're not going to be a big pain in the ass of the entrepreneur. Um, but I think the most important thing for us obvi is obviously valuation, uh, preference, right? Uh, dividends and and uh, how much dilution you'll you'll be taking and pre and post option pool refreshing. So that basically, I don't, most of you are probably familiar with that, but it's also adding to the dilution of you if it's pre pre uh, closing and post closing when you refresh your pool 15% meaning more options are available to people uh, outside of you and it's just your new employees, you're being diluted 10 or 15% more, so you've got to be aware of that. So I would say that um, to your question about standardization, um, hopefully I, in a good market, it's your market. So in a bad market like 08 or 09, we're going to put maybe full participation, uh, 2x preference so we get our money out 2x before anyone gets their money. But in a good market, I mean, you can kind of 
commanded. So I would say that you want something clean that whatever future investors come in and see it, they're going to want to copy that clean structure. So not full participation. You want convertible preferred where we have our option of converting it to equity or we get our money out, right? Whereas full participation, as most of you know, we get our money out and then we uh, double dip and get equity, or we convert as we were common. So I would be wary because I don't know if I answered your question, but those are the things we look for. Keep it clean and then future rounds will keep it clean. And I, I think the most important thing too is to keep your cap table clean. Um, uh, it's really important, I think, that for us it's harder to invest in companies when there are four or five co-founders because now they're all really sensitive to dilution. Um, and having, each having 20% is so different from having 50 to 100% of the company where we sometimes can't get a deal done because all the founders just can't agree to owning 15% of a company anymore. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Cool. We got time for one more quick question. One and two. We can answer all of them, man. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> So from a VC perspective, hey, sorry about that. Um, from a VC perspective, um, you talk about the overvaluation of startups, um, like WhatsApp just got, I think, 19 billion. Um, what do you think is causing it? So maybe you're of the perspective where you're always a little bit more cautious as the markets rise and fall, but I mean, what's, what's up with that? Fear of missing out, I think. Um, and, and in the, in the um, instance of Facebook, right, um, that was a very, very competitive process of, of buying WhatsApp. Um, they had offers from, I think, I heard, close to 10 different parties, right, and other people wanted to finance them. So with Mark and what he does, and I don't know him very well, but I, I have friends who are apparently good friends with him. He, like with Facebook, right, it's not like LinkedIn, where there's one work network. Right now, it doesn't look like there's anything that can disrupt that or compete with that. But with Facebook, there are all sorts of other ways to communicate with your friends, and that younger core demographic is key for making Facebook stay like Facebook and not MySpace, right? So owning the mobile messaging internationally was really important to him. It uh, was really strategic, right? That, that was probably the number one thing. Plus, they're also revenue generated. I don't know if most people know, but after a year, right, you have to pay a dollar to be on WhatsApp. So there, I heard, it was rumored, they were doing um, a couple hundred million dollars in revenue and highly profitable with I think 45 people work there. So they're buying it off the, the actual metrics and the growth, adding a million users. So to answer your question um, about valuation, um, sometimes when you want to bid up and pay and you think it's important to you, and you just, just go get it, right? And, and some people do that, and we don't. We're not going to be um, bidding and, and hopefully winning on, on things. We hope that we want to work with people that want to work with us, right? And, and we, when we invest, we, it, it's generally because uh, it's not a, like a, an auction. We go and are preemptive and want to work with that entrepreneur, and hopefully they want to work with us. So I don't know if that was helpful, but. Cool. All right. Thank um, you all for your time. Yeah, I don't know well, if that's well, awesome. I, I, so we always like to end the, uh, the, this interview part of the Fireside Chat with uh, a unique question that uh, we're going to copy the DC chapter right now. I'm sure Brian's going to look at me and smile over there. Um, so we always like to ask, you know, our our fireside chat uh, attendee, uh, you know, what or who is your favorite superhero or historical figure? Iron Man. And wow. why? I love. Wow. And why? I mean, I never read the comic books, right? But you guys all watch the movies, yeah. right? How would you not want to be Tony Stark yeah. and <laughs> hang out with Scarlet all day and, and Gwyneth and fly around, People be like, I know, and like have yeah. every toy, right? I don't know. It seemed a lot more cool than. Maybe like uh, Batman was pretty cool too, the new ones, right? But I mean, Tony's just so much cooler, Very I would think. Cool, yeah. I mean, you all saw the cameos that uh, Elon was in there from Tesla and, and SpaceX. He was in the second one, and it was a pretty cool tribute to him. Well, you know, not tribute, but I mean, he's like the real Tony Stark, yeah. right? I mean, it's actually funny that you said that. Uh, I was on Wikipedia, because I'm sure all of you guys go on your Wikipedia tangents. Um, and I looked up uh, Elon Musk one day, and uh, the Tony Stark. Uh, character is based off Elon Musk. So if any of you guys didn't know that, that's your uh, fun fact for the day. <laughs> Compliments to me, that's a free one. And people, <laughs> and then get this, right, so that's a great point. But in 2009 or whenever, or 10, or when Tesla was kind of on the down and um, all his companies were kind of not really going that well, he was borrowing money from everyone, sleeping on people's couches, right? Now everyone's saying how, like, how smart and how great he is. He is, right? I don't doubt that, but I mean, he was that close to being like bankrupt, and right? Homeless, so yeah. and homeless. I mean, it, it's an amazing story. <laughs> good for him. And one good market and a couple.
good years, right? It, it's all it takes. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, just one last question I'm going to throw in is, uh, you know, if you had some advice on uh, what to expect, especially because I, I talked to some of the guys in the room and girls, sorry about that, uh, some of the you know, people in the room today, um, just trying to get a better idea of, you know, what type of startups they're starting. And a lot of them, it seems like, are newer or earlier stage startups. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your, you know, kind of parting, parting words for them? in terms of what to expect, uh, you know, just kind of some, some Bobby wisdom. Um, I would keep, keep working incredibly hard like you all are. Um, don't waste time on stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, get, just move the chains, right? Move the chains, that, that's all it is. And, and those are the types of businesses, frankly, that I like where, okay, it's just, I know what I need to do. I, knew, I know what I need to get done. We're gonna, just gonna go do it. Um, I'd focus on that. And day to day, just get better every day, frankly. And then at the end, you hopefully will be pretty happy. And that's where a lot of the folks, frankly, when I was first talking to them at a similar event in DC in 2008 or 2009 or whatever, they had these like little ideas. Where I'm like, oh, cool, you know, great guy, great girl, like whatever. And then now they're all like $50 million raises, and yeah. you know, they're, they're but they're the same people, right? So you hope that also for all of you that do become or are already successful, um, make sure that you angel invest, please. You'll make our jobs easier. Um, and give it back, you try to give back to the community because uh, um, this is the whole reason why we have a job and, and I, what, why everyone is here, right? So I'd say just try to pay it forward in your time or your resources or whatever it is because I think that's what's lacking when we talked about it where I think that a lot of after big exits, right, people move to their manors and XYZ suburb and never came back. And we're in the Valley, it's, it's almost like a club where you, you want to be part of that club again and you got to go and put money back into the system, right? And you'd only do that by your time and being an advisor, sitting on boards and investing, right? So when you're all billionaires, please just and invest in us so we can have jobs and all that. So anyway, that, that'd be my advice. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we could just uh, have Bobby uh, one more one more round of applause. Thank for you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.